Hey everybody, I'm Brad Palumbo, and welcome back to my series, Brad Debates, where I hash out ideas and disagreements with people from across the political spectrum. Today with me is actual justice warrior, aka Sean Fitzgerald, who joins me to discuss and debate criminal justice reform. Sean, thanks for coming on. Uh, thank you for having me and having the conversation. Yeah, it's great to talk to you. Uh, you and I, I would say on most things, are probably pretty politically aligned. Criminal justice, though, is one I wanted to talk to you because you kind of have a more, um, you know, pro-law enforcement view than me. I'm more of a criminal justice reform advocate. So that's a big debate on the right right now, you know, between libertarians and conservatives and Republicans is uh, how much of the criminal justice reform stuff is progressive nonsense and how much of it actually has some merit. Um, just to take your temperature on this issue, so the U.S., uh, do you, would you agree that the U.S. has a mass incarceration problem, broadly speaking? I mean, the U.S. has more violent crime than most modern Western nations, so it depends on, on the specific crime. But overall, I don't think you just look at the number of prisoners and say, by the very nature that it's a high number, the U.S. Is, has a problem. Yeah, I mean, the U.S. has the most per population. I mean, your point's taken that that alone doesn't tell us too much. But then I, I think of all the ways in which we criminalize nonviolent behavior, right? I'm hardly an anarchist. I absolutely support locking up violent criminals. I don't support, and I think you would largely agree with me on this, locking up people for things like the war on drugs, which we've done a lot of in this country, which is why I do have some sympathy for the claim that we have mass incarceration, because some of that's violent criminals, but a good number uh, of it are, are drug-related offenses, too. Right. And, and for the drug-related, I, I actually hate the phrase nonviolent criminal because you can be nonviolent and have victims. I think victimless crimes, being incarcerated for those are a bigger issue. And that's what I would put the drug users and even the sellers. Like if we had a legal system for the distribution of these drugs, you know, age limits like we had alcohol, I think overall that would be a better policy. But, you know, Bernie Madoff didn't punch anybody in the face, but he ruined thousands of lives with his actions in the financial sector. So like, even though it's nonviolent, he should be incarcerated. Yeah, your point's taken. I guess when I say what I mean is victimless. I agree with you. Um, but I, I guess, so let me just talk you through my journey a little bit. A few years ago, I was definitely more of a traditional Republican on this issue, kind of a back the blue type. I will admit that what kind of it didn't radicalize me. I'm not radical on this issue. But what really opened my eyes to the idea of criminal justice reform over the, is over the last two years is watching the police around the world essentially enforce different forms of different levels of tyranny, right, with the COVID regimes, watching them go down and knock on doors, watching them arrest people for not wearing a mask on the beach, all these kinds of crazy things. And it made me think you know, my beliefs in limited government really aren't consistent with the kind of blind deference to police and law enforcement who are government officials at the end of the day and wield enormous amounts of power uh, that I apply to other issues. So how do you feel about the issue of, you know, just backing the blue, the general kind of sentiment and reflexive defense of the police that's widespread on the American right? I mean, overall, I think the like black, the blue or back to blue has their heart in the right place, because oftentimes what we see with these individual cases is that the media version of the story gets out and around the world and we never hear the response. And then we, when we finally do hear it, it doesn't get anywhere near as much attention so like you know michael brown's story is a perfect example of that officer wilson was 100 percent in the right he told the truth brown's best friend who lied to his parents was proven to be a liar by the forensics by the majority of the witnesses but most people think officer darren wilson is a murderer because you know we assume that the first story that we hear the more salacious one is more accurate but yeah there are individual instances where law enforcement officers or even mass instances like covid policing where they're utilized to enforce bad policy. So, like, I think a focus on the policy uh, rather than the enforcement mechanism for the policy should be the problem. Like, in an ideal world, maybe a police officer who has taken an oath to uphold the Constitution would refuse to ticket people for wearing masks or whatever, but, you know, they're under the pressure of being fired for their job. And by the way, their reward for enforcing all those restrictions was getting fired for their job for not taking uh, a mandatory vaccination. Yeah, I certainly don't support that. Um, but 
I guess this brings us to one of, I think, the, the main points of contention that you and I will probably have on this issue, which is the question of qualified immunity. And before we dive into it, I just want to give uh, listeners and viewers a sense of what qualified immunity is. It is a judicial doctrine created by the Supreme Court in 1983 that provides not criminal, but civil liability protections for government employees in some cases, not all cases, many cases, where so, for example, if I believe an officer has violated my constitutional rights, I uh, can sue them, but that lawsuit may be blocked from moving forward by qualified immunity in many, arguably a majority of cases. Uh, And the standard that they've created to use is that you must show that there's an exactly similar situation that in the past where they could have known, oh, this action violates someone's rights. Um, and, And so as a result of that standard, oftentimes lawsuits against law enforcement officials are blocked under this standard uh, and you can't get your day in court, you can't get civil damages, you can't get civil justice when your your rights are in the cases where they truly are violated. That's something I support, frankly, at least re- reforming, but uh, if I could, repeal it entirely. I'm politically pragmatic, so maybe not. Uh, but what's your view on qualified immunity? So, like... Overall, maybe it is like too stringent, so I would be willing to look at that. I would be willing to examine it. But overall, typically what we deal with in terms of lawsuits is people want to sue the person with the money. So qualified immunity protects the individual officers from civil rights violations, but not the police as an institution. I mean, go look at your major metropolitan areas and how much they pay out in these kind of violations each and every year because they think it's cheaper to settle. So what qual- what the ending of qualified immunity, the goal of it is, is to limit policing and hurt police officers is from what I've seen. Like one of the case study examples of this is in fact the Michael Brown case where Officer Wilson was justified in his actions. Read the Department of Justice report. And the idea that you could drag every single officer into court for every single alleged civil rights violation, it's just going to bog down policing to the point where it's completely ineffective. So should qualified immunity be hammered out legislatively rather than judicially? Sure. But I have a lack of faith in the reason why the people who want to get rid of it want to get rid of it, because these are the same people who want to defund the police, abolish the police. And again, it runs contrary to how we think of lawsuits functioning in any other sector. If you slip on a floor in Walmart because they didn't put the caution uh, floor wet sign, you don't sue the random employee who put the who didn't put that sign. You, you end could. up doing Walmart. And you'd you, lose. But, but you'd have the you, chance to have your day in court, but you would lose. But but the reason you don't sue that person is because they don't have any money, and police officers individually don't have the money to cover these things anyway. So it's just an effort to try to bankrupt police officers to undermine policing, in my view. So I, a couple points where I disagree with you there. I get where you're coming from, but I do disagree with you. One being... You're right that some of the people who push qualified immunity repeal are these hard left, I hate police, abolish police types. But it's actually something that a lot of reasonable center right people agree with. And in fact, a morning consult poll of police officers, so everybody surveyed was a law enforcement officer, found that 57% support repealing qualified immunity. Maybe there's other polls that find other numbers. But like a lot of police are actually okay with the idea of repealing qualified immunity. So I kind of reject the idea that it's an inherently anti-police position. Well, you, I mean, you can propagandize against an issue and convince people that something's bad, but I guarantee you when these officers start getting lawsuits from every single person alleging an excessive force or some kind of civil rights abuse, they're gonna realize the mistake that they've made. So. Yeah, a poll saying that the majority of this group or that group doesn't change my opinion about the practical reality of how police needs to function in the United States of America. And the fact is, if you can sue every officer and you have to drag them into court and there isn't some kind of barrier to entry, like if we had a loser pay system where if you lose these lawsuits, you're on the hook for the legal fees, then we could have a conversation. But we don't have that system. So you can not win any of these cases and you still end up beating the officer in that you've bankrupted him because he has to hire attorneys. So I will, what I'll say is this, uh, the system, if we were to get rid of qualified immunity, the system would more closely resemble what we have with doctors who are required to have malpractice insurance. 
And so that's why it wouldn't bankrupt them. But if they lost multiple lawsuits, they would, uh, because they were bad cops, bad apples, they would, yeah, their insurance would become too expensive for them to remain police officers. And we would actually be able to weed out the bad apples where right now, I believe that the police unions often are able to protect the bad cops who actually do a disservice to the majority of good police officers and they don't get fired easily enough. This would actually help weed them out. I would even be willing to support pay increases accompanying qualified immunity repeal to allow them to afford the malpractice insurance. But we have a workable system when it comes to doctors and malpractice lawsuits. They don't have a liability shield. I don't really see why police should be any different because we're talking about people who are trusted with the power over life and death, the right to use violence against us. So it's just as essential as doctors and we're able to do that in that scenario. Why, why is it different in your view? Well, there's there's two things. One, whenever you do anything with a doctor, you sign a million waivers before you get into the interaction. Police interactions by their very nature are not voluntary, but I'm sure you could construct a system where they have some level of malpractice insurance, something to compensate for what's lost that maybe if I looked at it, I would want to get behind. But there are fundamental differences between the medical malpractice system in that you have voluntary interactions for the most part, emergency room visits different with doctors where you sign a bunch of waivers and they have to mess up in a way that's outside the confines of the waiver before the suit can proceed. Yeah, I get what you're saying, but if anything, to me, that makes it, the fact that it's not voluntary, that, that you, you can choose whether to go to the doctors, but you can't choose whether you get to interact with the police, actually makes being able to get justice and hold them accountable and get your day in court more important, not less. Right. I, I understand that. But I'm just saying there is a limiting mechanism in the medical malpractice system in that you have those waivers and you have to go through those legal documents. So there's a barrier to suit that doesn't exist with law enforcement. I get the argument that we would be flooded with lawsuits. And, you know, we would definitely have more lawsuits. We're too litigious as a country. But I think there would still be a barrier to entry because you would have to hire attorneys to sue or you would work with the same way they do in like ambulance chaser law uh, attorneys who only who work on commission but don't charge their clients anything. But those attorneys only take cases they think well, they'll actually win. Like they don't just take every case because they would waste a lot of time and get zero dollars. So there would be some limiting system. And more importantly, qualified immunity did not exist until 1983. It was created by the Supreme Court. I'm not aware of any like absolute sh staffing shortage or police demoralization or dehabilitating lawsuits in the decades that preceded its creation. So I'm not sure like why wouldn't if that's really what would happen if we got rid of it, why didn't it happen back then? Well, we've actually have more lawyers than we used to have back in the in the 70s. There's like a point in time in American history. I think it's the 70s going into the 80s where we had an explosion of litigators this is where we got like our our regulatory class from. So like there is more attorneys. So maybe they were trying to head something off. But like, yeah, look, I understand that you like you could have reservations. There's some things that you need to tweak about it. And even I even like the idea a lot of having them have some form of malpractice insurance. So like I'm on board, I would say maybe 30 percent more than when I got here. But I, I still think you need some kind of limiting factor. I, I don't like the idea that you need an exact, you know, pound for pound, circumstance for circumstance, civil rights violation. I think we do equivalent cases in in other matters of law. So I think that definitely needs to be adjusted. But again, this is something that needs to be done by the legislature. We rely way too heavily on the courts to to adjudicate all these things. And I think that's one of the biggest problems. I would love for states to work out their own kind of legal systems for this, at least in the state level, so then we could see which system works better and if we actually do get better policing results. Yeah, I, I get your point, and I actually agree with something you said there, which is changing the standard. Because the problem I have right now is what you hinted at. Uh, in order to proceed with your lawsuit, you have to have like an exactly similar precedent on the books. But what that means is that in unusual situations, you can't get justice. So like, I'm going to read you some examples from USA Today about cases that were blocked. And these are the allegations. The, the exact stories could be different, but these are the allegations. Uh, officers who shot a 10 year old while trying to, by accident while trying to shoot a non threatening family dog. Prisoners, prison officials who locked an inmate in a sewage flooded cell for days 
SWAT team members who fired gas grenades into an innocent woman's empty home, an officer who body slammed a five foot tall woman for walking away from him, police who picked up a mentally infirmed man, drove him to the county line and dropped him off at dusk along the highway where he was later struck and killed by a motorist. Now, in all these cases, I understand that they weren't convicted or proven, but these are unique situations and there is no exact precedent. So they weren't able to get their day in court and, and make their case and pursue justice and damages against these officers because there was no exact same precedent. So I think that standard is unworkable and I think it's wrong to have a system that stops. Like I get what you're saying about student departments, but that ultimately just means taxpayers have to pay for it. I think the guys, if they truly did these things, if you shot a 10 year old while you were trying to shoot a non-threatening dog, you should have to pay for that as an individual. Yeah, but you don't have the – like you are performing a function as law enforcement. Like I'm fine with – if I mean that action to me sounds like a criminal action possibly, like not really like I need to go get this individual officer's pension and a department problem. So I would prefer if – and I'm sure a bunch of these cases, they did sue the department. And I mean some of them like sound worse than they actually are. I mean if you drop some guy off and then he walked into the street and got hit by a car – I mean, like, you have to go to court individually to deal with that? This seems a little weird. Like, I don't know the specifics of the case. But, again, like, you can find cases that are bad. And, yes, I 100% agree that the exact you need an exact similar circumstance is an absurd standard that we don't hold any, like, we, I don't think any profession gets held to that. Or, you know, I could be wrong. But, um, yeah, I, I still would prefer that you sue the organization. And I don't want to pay these as taxpayers. But the thing is is that we have to have police so like that is an essential function of government so like sometimes you have to pay for the downsides of having a police department when they mess up yeah i agree that we have to have police i'm not an abolish the police type uh, but i think we could have police who are accountable uh, in fact we've had several states uh like new mexico have abolished qualified immunity in their states and as far as i know their, their police forces have not disintegrated but um you mentioned the point about the, in the well, I want to get your what your thoughts on one idea that I've seen some kind of Republicans uh, propose as a reform compromise. Essentially, what they would do is they would invert the standard, flip it around. So now you are shielded in any case when there's a precedent on the books where your where the similar actions were found to not be a violation of their rights. And when there's not a precedent, then the lawsuit can proceed. I would be okay with something like that as a compromise measure. Um, but that has been vigorously opposed by the police unions and the, the pro-police activist groups, even though I think it's a pretty reasonable compromise. I mean, it's it's uh, I, I don't know how many police cases were neutered due to the fact that we had the qualified immunity doctrine in the reverse. But I would look at it like I'm not I'm not 100 percent. You can never sue an individual officer. I'm just pointing out that the motive behind this in large part is to harm officers, not necessarily to reform behavior. But, you know, it would be interesting if you had a if you had um if, if you had at least in a pre like pre discovery phase where you put something forward and then a judge could quickly up or down approve or dismiss the lawsuit then i think that would be a better situation and it would limit some of the costs associated with like this strategy of trying to bankrupt officers so if you had something like that i mean i would be i would be okay with it okay guys let us know what you think about qualified immunity in the comments do you want to get rid of it do you support keeping it especially if you're a, a law enforcement officer let us know your thoughts let's talk about bail reform so um, let's just get, so, so there's been bail reform in a bunch of liberal cities under progressive prosecutors. And I think these bail reforms have often been done very poorly, but I support the idea of bail reform because I think cash bail is a fundamentally immoral system. What is your general view on cash bail and bail reform? Well, I, well there, I'm sure you could find a piece of bail reform legislation that I might get behind. 
However, what we've seen in, in the implement, implementation of these new get rid of cash bail laws is utter chaos being the result of it. I mean, New York State has the worst bail law in the entire country where it guarantees same day automatic release or next day automatic release for a number of crimes. And these include a bunch of felonies. I mean, originally on the list was aggravated vehicular homicide. So if you if you intentionally run somebody over, you're going to get a same day release. It doesn't include looking at somebody's previous history and it doesn't include how many times you reoffend. and also if you don't show up to court which is like the one thing that even the most progressive person that i've talked to says you should set bail for which is flight risk it doesn't include that so you can commit all of these crimes over and over again and get released automatically and i just think that's absurd as for bail i think people get a, a wrong premise about this being like some form of punishment or somehow it's a violation of the idea that you're innocent until proven guilty that is not the case bail is in like in lieu of the fact that you are present awaiting trial because the assumption when the constitution was founded was that you are going to be held in the dungeon like is rooted in our english tradition and then await your trial so bail is is a reform in that you could put something in place of yourself, some kind of collateral to hold your position so you can be out awaiting trial. And I think the reforms that we need to see with people languishing in jails pre-trial for a long period of time need to be on the speedy trial phase of, of that because that's actually more in line with the Constitution rather than on the bail portion of it. Yeah, I agree that we need speedy trials and that's a real problem. Um, I think... On the bail side of things, I get what you're saying about how the Constitution of the Founding Fathers, I think that's messed up, though, that you would just have to sit in jail and await your trial, especially if it's a long term because you haven't been convicted of anything. But the um, the bail reform in New York is especially poorly done. Like the, I, I, I'm not remembering this perfectly, so I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure the guy who assaulted Lee Z Zedlin or Zeldin, the Republican governor candidate, was then immediately released like a day later under bail reform. Couple, that's, couple hours. Yeah, that's nuts. Uh, that's insane. Because the thing for me, Sean, is that I think bail should be a awarded a a based on your threat to the public and your whether you committed a violent offense or not, not whatever this, this bail reform standards are, but also not how much money you have. And the thing that I don't like about cash bail is two people commit the same crime. One is rich, one is poor. There are many scenarios in which the poor guy's got to sit in a jail cell for months before his trial, and the rich guy gets out on bail. Uh, and that's like fundamentally immoral. Like that's wrong to have to have uh, one guy get this presumption of innocence and be out free awaiting his trial because of his circumstances in life and another guy be sitting in a jail cell because he's poor. Like we're supposed to have equality under the law. And to me, cash bail violates it, that principle. Right. Well, I mean, you're supposed to throw down some level of collateral that like would incentivize you to go back to court. So I can understand, you know, like for somebody who's making 30 grand, how a hundred thousand dollar bond is absurd but i will say in most circumstances you have to put down like 12 percent or something like that for a bail bondsman but you end up losing that so even then 10 to twelve thousand dollars would be would be a disaster so i'm fine with i'm fine with uh like you know maybe even reducing the amount that you would have to put put up for bail but like the result of bail reform it's it's the biggest red herring ever because they'll make a case like you just made about about somebody who can't get out of jail because they're poor but what they'll put into the law is the removal of the ability to judge these cases by the judge, and these people will get same-day automatic release. Or if they have a district attorney, they'll get under charge so that they fit within a crime where they get released the next day. So, like, it's, it's almost like... Like, I, I understand that issue, but the bail reform statutes are a completely different monster all on their own. Uh, I, I think they're not all created equal. I think I have seen some that are much more reasonable than others. New York's is especially atrocious. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, I guess I just, I, I'm very open to the idea of bail reform. And I worry right now that what we're seeing, um, and this is more of a criticism of progressives than a criticism of folks in your camp, is that there are so many reasonable criminal justice ideas, and our system is, in my view, very broken, but they're, whether it's like the lawlessness that we're seeing in, in the, many of these liberal cities is setting back those reasonable reform movements 
a decade at least, right? I, I was a big supporter of the First Step Act under President Trump, the Republican criminal justice reform. I think we need a second step that goes a lot farther. Uh, and that was in, in terms of reducing mandatory minimums and excessive drug sentences and other and removing some disparities under the law. Um, but I think there's so much that should be done. Another thing I have a big problem with that I'm curious for your view on is civil asset forfeiture, where the police right now can essentially just confiscate assets they suspect are involved in a crime. So money, cars, even yeah. homes. Uh, and then you can't get it back for months and months and months and you have to hire lawyers and fight to get it back or in many cases you don't get it back and the officers get to reroute it into law enforcement budgets. Um, I think that's a totally messed up system. Uh, I don't know. What's your thoughts on, on civil asset well, forfeiture? I, I think civil asset forfeiture, it's where your property is deemed guilty and you have to prove it innocent. It's a violation of the takings clause of the Fifth Amendment. Like the compensation comes before you seize property and you should only lose assets tied to illegal activity after they're proven to be tied to illegal activity. And it's right. it's really bad because in a, in a bunch of places, essentially the cops are incentivized to steal under like $8,000 from you because if you end up hiring a lawyer to fight back, it's going to cost you about eight thousand dollars. So, like, it's 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 a bad system. Not not in favor of it. I think it's nonsensical. But uh, like, you know, for the for the bail issue, the the reason like. There, New York has an especially bad one, but it always comes with the accompanying thing of all these crimes that are no longer eligible for a judge to issue judgment. And that would be my problem with the mandatory minimum is that when you get to the sentencing phase, this prestigious judge that is supposed to be able to give a ruling based on the specific circumstances of the of the case within guidelines ends up being handcuffed. So, you know, one of the problems that we see in California is they put it on the ballot that you're not going to get any serious charges for shoplifting. And the result of that is not, oh, like it's a better place in California and like all these poor people are, are aided by it. The result of that is organized retail theft. And then people yeah. are made poorer because their stores are all closing and like jobs are drying up. So I, I know I agree with you, that especially in San Francisco, they had a proposition to like reduce uh, some level of petty larceny and make it stop criminalizing it. And I'm like, that's insane. Right. And they have shoplifting problems there. But that actually raises an interesting point. I want to know what your position on is. Um, it's kind of nuanced how the extent to, to how bad it is. Uh, but we are in a crime wave across the country. Right. Crime is rising. A lot of people blame that on the defund the police movement or criminal justice reform. I don't really. I mostly blame it on the mass economic devastation caused by government lockdowns during COVID. You know, economic outcomes and crime are strongly correlated. And when you take away people's jobs, you skyrocket drug abuse, all these unintended consequences of these authoritarian lockdowns. I think that was inevitably going to lead to a surge in crime. And I think crime has surged uh, as well in lots of red states. Uh, I mean, so it's, it's been especially acute in some liberal cities. I'll give you that. But I think that the right wing narrative I'm starting to see about how we've got a crime wave because of criminal justice reform and Democrat policy is at best highly simplistic and at worst partially uh, partially wrong what what do you think uh i i would disagree with the the fact that it's inevitable after an economic downturn if you there's there's a great article about the crime wave that never happened during the great recession where we had you know 10 percent unemployment all these other issues and crime continued to go down and i do think that there's a part is due to policy but a part of it is due to like a change in the in in the temperature of the country and like the fact that we look down on on the law enforcement profession more and that does have an impact the fact that there's less trust in our society does have an impact there was like a, a pyramid when i was in school of of what makes somebody law-abiding and the lowest portion of the pyramid is consequences where you're not 
where because basically if you're only afraid of the consequences of criminal action and the sentence that you might get if you think you're going to get away with the crime you're going to commit the crime the second one is a social consequence the fact that you would be ostracized from your community if you committed such an offense and the number one uh thing that pre prevents people from committing crimes is if they believe the law is justified if they think that the it, the punishment is proportional and they understand the philosophy behind it well we're down on all three of those right now like they're like people people question the existence of the criminal justice system they think it's systemically racist in certain communities you're not looked down upon you're not shunned the way that you should be after you commit a serious crime and the consequences aren't being delivered and we're seeing that and a specific example would be the city of new orleans which froze their police department's budget for a few years and this is actually before the black lives matter like george floyd situation then they ended up having to do a 10 percent cut in budget but more importantly they ended up cutting 25 percent of their officers and they went and they weren't doing well before to be to be clear which many in my audience have pointed out but new orleans went from around seventh in homicides in the country to this year if they keep up their current pace they're number one and baltimore st louis and detroit have been holding those top three spots for years in this nation so for them to leapfrog all of those cities in a single year is a crazy situation and it's largely due to the fact that they have like the worst combination of factors democratic mayor who's soft on crime police department in decline can't recruit people lower budget and they have a prosecutor who refuses to prosecute everybody so i do think that we are seeing spikes in crime largely due to the, to the things that i just outlined yeah i just I, I think economic devastation and i think the lockdowns are different from the great recession i think they're they're categorically different and they caused huge waves of despair and mental illness uh, that I think absolutely would have contributed to crime. I think it's hard to disentangle how much of it is due to what. Uh, I certainly don't want to live in any of those cities. I moved out of Washington, D.C. in part because of the way that they ran it, uh, in, including their approach to crime in the post-George Floyd protest riots. Uh, I, I had friends living in the city at the time who would look out their window and see the gas station across the street or the 7-Eleven having its window smashed in uh, and just getting looted. And then they're like looking around. They're like, oh, no police. It's been going on for a while. Uh, I, I have other friends who it just actually weirdly became normal for like a year to drive around the city and just see stores boarding up. Because there's something in the news that they knew was going to piss people off. So they start boarding up their windows. I agree with you, like that is not okay. That is not normal. Uh, so I'm certainly not defending any of that, but I do think the picture is perhaps more complicated than a lot of what you suggested and what, what the, the general narrative is right now. But uh, you know, maybe but, that but, is, but a, it, oh sure, go ahead. But, but it's also crucial to understand, and this is something that, um, you know, uh, there's an old school criminal justice philosopher, James, uh, James P. Wilson wrote about that like we could spend all day debating the root causes but like fundamentally root causes are not more important than any other kind of cause because if the most efficient way to address crime doesn't involve addressing the root cause then that doesn't matter we should just fix the most we should fix it in the most efficient way possible and a perfect example of this is let's say you're diagnosed with a terminal illness we could spend a ton of money trying to research a cure for that terminal illness or but if we can more easily treat the symptoms and make it more manageable so that it doesn't have an effect on you, we're not addressing the root cause, but we're solving your problem. And that's the way we deal with a lot of illnesses in the human body. And it's also applicable to society. So whether or not people like the recession for some reason is working differently than than the Great Recession in 08. Uh, like that's neither here nor there. The fact of the matter is like we're seeing a crime spike and there are ways that we can address it more efficiently and to the point and pulling back on law enforcement is not one of those ways. I guess uh, I, I support pulling back on law enforcement in the sense of redirecting their priorities. I think we ask law enforcement to do far too much and I would have them simply focus on truly violent crime, truly victim creating crime and stop doing all of the nanny state um, kind of enforcement and also the kind of like highway robbery stuff that they do, the ticket quotas, the civil asset forfeiture, uh, and really just focus on the, the violent crime. Because I agree they're not doing a great job on that. But I mean, but, 
But there's quality of life crimes that they should be enforcing because they have downstream consequences. If you're allowing all these homeless encampments, then people are thinking nobody's watching this and you end up having the effect of more crime and more serious crime coming in to fill that gap. Like, you know, uh, the, it, this is like the classic broken windows example. If you leave a window broken in a building in a major metropolitan area for long enough, every window in that building will be broken. The example I like to use is go to a nice park in your neighborhood, dump a whole bag of recyclables in a pile, have nobody clean it up for a week, and you'll come back. The pile is going to be 10 times the size because people are just going to assume that's where you throw your garbage. So if you create an area that has all of these problems and it's clear it looks like nobody's watching it criminality is going to concentrate there because our environment does impact our behavior all right well we can leave it there folks let us know what you think in the comments below sean uh thanks for coming on thanks for having this conversation i appreciate it um yeah thank you, thank for you. Having me.